I love that this conference is called Fluent. It has a better name than a lot of linguistics conferences. So as Peter said, I'm a lexicographer. I make dictionaries, and that's a kind of applied linguist. So as an applied linguist, I like to apply linguistics to everything. I find that two even thin coats of linguistics work best for most things. Um, but why is a dictionary editor and an applied linguist talking to you about JavaScript? So basically, last year I made this joke on Twitter. And uh, so two things. First of all, never tweet. And <laughs> uh, secondly, um, <laughs> sometimes things are funny because they're true. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows uh, what Esperanto is. It's a constructed language. It's an artificial language that was invented more than 100 years ago when Brendan Eich needed something quick to ship with Netscape Navigator. <laughs> Um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, when Dr. Zamenhof wanted to create a politically neutral language to facilitate world understanding. So basically the same thing. Uh, so there are an estimated between uh, 100,000 and 2 million speakers of Esperanto. And uh, Stack Overflow says that there are about 67,000 users of JavaScript. Um, so those numbers are almost comparable. There are more than 1,400 people here at Fluent, and there were an average of 1,000 people at the last five World Esperanto Congresses. Um, now, to be fair, it is very difficult to get a job writing Esperanto, and it is very difficult not to get a job writing JavaScript. Uh, how many people left the speed meetup this morning accidentally employed? Uh, so, but... Um, <laughs> Esperanto is an artificial or a constructed language. Uh, now, these are sometimes called conlangs. And uh, this is a very popular conlang. Um, does anybody recognize what this language is? Nobody? Klingon, yes. So usually, that's the kind of environment that we expect to find constructed languages. They're usually used to make, um, make mythical places feel more real, You know, places like Middle Earth or the browser. And, but there's, there's usually a lot of, you know, there's some overlap between the community of, you know, conlang enthusiasts and uh, computer science professionals. Although computer science has not always been very accommodating to constructed languages. Like Ubuntu, dudes, why, why no support for Klingon and Esperanto? Um, now, we tend to think of programming languages as primarily sets of instructions that we use to control computers. We say jump, and the computers say how high, except, of course, in JavaScript, where missing parameters silently fail. Now, but, you know, we're not really here at Fluent talking about how to give instructions to computers. A lot of what we've heard in the last couple of days have been talking about JavaScript to each other, to other human beings. And, of course, all languages have a persuasive component. We often talk about how to get people to do things. And uh, when you were a kid, did anybody ever not give you something until you said the magic word? All languages used by humans are used to persuade. And once you start to see the uh, once you start to see programming languages through the filter of how natural languages work, you see lots and lots of parallels. For example, one of the basic tenets of linguistics is arbitrariness. There's no relationship between how we say something and what we're saying. Now, there's some few exceptions, like onomatopoetic words that sound like what they mean. But usually, the connection between what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it is completely arbitrary. And we see this in programming languages, especially in esoteric languages. Now, I'm sure you all recognize that this is hello world uh, in a language called semicolon. Um, I'm sure you can see why that language is called semicolon. Uh, but you know, there's an arbitrariness to how we give the instructions to the computer and what instructions we're actually giving. And um, so. <laughs> One of the things that I've been saying for the last couple of days when people ask me what my talk is about, I say very excitedly, I think JavaScript is a creole. And people look at me and they go, oh, well. <laughs> so a creole is a kind of language that is, and I'm going to quote Wikipedia here, that is developed by adults for use as a second language and then becomes the native or primary language of their children. Does it sound like JavaScript to you? 
<laughs> you know, it was constructed as a second language, and now a lot of people speak native JavaScript. Now, pigeons, which is how Creoles start, they usually inherit features from their origin languages, from their languages of their original speakers in simplified form. So you can see here all the features that JavaScript inherited from what we consider to be parent languages. Uh, JavaScript even has dialects. You probably call them browsers. And yeah, I'm not going to even bother to go through this slide. Uh, <laughs> and I don't really think I need to comment about this very much, but when we talk about natural languages, we don't really think about them as being uh, the main purpose of them to be high quality. We think of their main purpose is to be expressive and communicative. Now, uh, this is an obligatory weird Venn diagram because everybody likes to see the word semiotics in a linguistics talk. And uh, also, um, because I thought the title of the book that this came from, The Semiotics of Programming, would kind of subtly signal that I'm not the only person who's ever been thinking about this way too much. Now, if you see these kinds of language-like behaviors in a, in a programming language, in a constructed language, well, it's pretty easy to just call it a language. And um, also, because it's also obligatory to talk about duck typing. But when you see something that acts like a natural language, you can think of it as a language. But what does thinking about JavaScript as a human language actually get you? How does it help? Well, first of all, it gives us new things to be mad about. Um, and I think that that's really useful. I don't usually get mad about language. I get excited about language, but I find that people often like to get mad about language. And often when people talk um, about things that they're mad about in language, they talk about grammar. They say, oh, that's bad grammar. And sometimes when people talk about programming languages, they say, oh, that's not elegant. That's illogical. Now, it's really hard to make a truly ungrammatical sentence in English because native speakers' brains just filter out ungrammaticality. In fact, it took me a long time to Google a truly ungrammatical sentence. This sentence, sense no make. Now, uh, and in the same way with computing languages, we have a backstop. We have the V8 engine. It will tell us when things don't work. Everything else that we get mad about is usually not about logic or grammar. It's usually about style. I mean, nobody ever says this kind of thing. Not even the IBM Watson voice yesterday said this kind of thing. Nobody sits you down and makes you memorize a list of rules that are to keep you from saying stuff like this. It just doesn't happen. Instead, we have rules like this. If something is impossible to do, people don't tell you not to do it. Nobody says in the morning, make sure you obey the law of gravity. It's just a given. Everything that people tell you not to do is possible to do, they just don't like it. And that's kind of what most language rules are about. When people say don't split an infinitive, it's because you can. When people say don't say most unique, it's because you can, and it just pisses people off. It's not impossible. So we have this for JavaScript. We have a set of things that are possible but piss people off. And that is one of the reasons why I think JavaScript is a lot like a natural language. And people come up with new opinions about JavaScript style all the time. Raise your hand if you bookmarked a style guide in the last month. Raise your hand if you wrote a style guide in the last month. <laughs> yes, it's possible to have these kinds of opinions about things that interact with other human beings. Um, and when you think about things that give people problems in natural languages, they also give people problems in computer languages. For instance, pronouns. It turns out that in English, the farther away the pronoun is from what it's referring to, the more errors people make in comprehension and the longer it takes them to understand the sentence. And now longer in this case is measured in milliseconds, but that's how we measure time in JavaScript anyway, so I think it's relevant. Um, so does this sound familiar? Yes. Pronouns are hard. And in English, sometimes words are used by different groups of people in contradictory ways. Uh, one example is the word enormity, which some people use to mean uh, its traditional meaning of very bad, and some people use it in the meaning very large. Now, when a word has this kind of transition of meaning, 
uh, style people, grammar mavens, they call this a skunked term. They say, don't use it. Even though you're both kind of sort of right, the other group is just going to be really mad at you. So you might as well leave it alone entirely because the word has a bad smell. And so there are some things that technically work in JavaScript that people say, leave it alone because it's hard to get right and people will be pissed at you. Things like eval and with. And sometimes language is just flat out ambiguous. You may have one value really firmly in mind. You may decide to call yourself AAA batteries because you want to be high up in that phone book that nobody uses anymore. But this value is kind of coerced to something completely different in most people's minds. I do not know how many calls these people get from uh, people who want them to come and fix their Wiimotes. <laughs> they, they deliver and install AAA batteries. What are you going to expect? Um, and relatedly, uh, sometimes if a, if a word can be misunderstood, you should assume that it will be misunderstood. And I think in a language that uh, does coercion, this is a principle to keep in mind as well. And of course, my favorite linguistic principle is also a computer language principle, which is the principle of least astonishment. If you have a sentence that ends like this, I haven't slept for 10 days because that would be too long. Uh, in English, that's great. That's a really good joke. This is my favorite Mitch Hedberg joke. If you have an expression in JavaScript that ends this way, you are a jerk. <laughs> you really want to keep people's astonishment to a minimum. Now, I think that when you're thinking about computer languages in the same way as natural languages, it helps you uh, bring to bear everything that we've learned in linguistics about how people interact with language, about how people interact with each other through language, and how you can use that information to be more clear, to learn languages faster. Uh, the great talk by Kathy Sierra yesterday talking about many, many examples in a short period of time, that's how people encourage you to learn a natural language. And of course, uh, I think that in both English and in JavaScript, the semicolon is unfairly maligned and is actually essential. Um, <laughs> I have lots of these semicolon appreciation society stickers. You can come find me at lunch if you want one. But this is the kind of thing that I think that uh, the more information that we can bring to bear that we've learned in fields like linguistics to fields like computing, which both involve lots of humans interacting with each other, the happier that we will be. So thank you so much for your attention, and thanks also to all the lovely people who CC licensed their photos so that I can make bad jokes about them. Um, and uh, please do come find me for a semicolon sticker. Thanks so much.